But way back where I come from, we never mean to bother. We don't like to make our fashions other people's concern. And we walk in the world of safe people. And it may be walking to our houses and birds. Welcome back, young scholars. This is the second video on Iowa State government. The big question you should be able to answer after watching this video is how has the state government of Iowa lived up to the Iowa State motto? So first we have to know what the Iowa State motto is. Here's the great seal of the state of Iowa and it contains our Iowa State motto. So here we go, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. That is the Iowa State motto, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. One of the things about the Iowa State seal that I always find interesting is it kind of looks like it was drawn by a fourth grader. But the reason the Iowa State seal looks the way it does is because that's the, the law of Iowa, it says in the Iowa State code. The Secretary of State is hereby authorized to procure a seal upon which shall be engraved the citizen soldier with a plow in his rear, that's kind of an unfortunate language, supporting the American flag, an eagle near the upper edge, holding in his beak a scroll with the following inscription upon it, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. The point that I want to make here is that rights and liberties and freedoms are very important in the state of Iowa. In fact, if you look at the structure of the Iowa State Constitution, the rights that we have as Iowans are spelled out at the very first section of the Constitution. In the U.S. Constitution, the rights are contained in the amendments. In Iowa, we place even greater emphasis on those rights, and so they're put first. When it comes to the rights of Iowans, there's a few stories that you should hear. The first involves a guy named Alexander Clark. He was a black man living in Muscatine, Iowa in the mid-1800s. He was a barber, which gave him access to powerful Iowans because he used to cut their hair. Alexander Clark was instrumental in helping to recruit an all-black regiment of soldiers from the Midwest that fought in the Civil War. After the Civil War was over, Alexander Clark then helped lobby the state legislators to pass an amendment to the Iowa State Constitution, and it was the, it's the very first amendment to the Iowa State Constitution which changed the language for the requirements for voters in the state of Iowa, and it did so by striking the word white, which obviously gave rights to people of color to vote in the state of Iowa. But probably the thing that Alexander Clark is most well known for was a decision that he made regarding Iowa schools. Alexander Clark sent his 12-year-old daughter, Susan, to school one day and said, you need to get enrolled at the local all-white school. Well, the principal sent Susan home and said she's not allowed to be enrolled in the all-white school because Iowa schools at that time were segregated. So Alexander Clark filed a lawsuit against the Muscatine School Board of Directors in 1868. So this is the case called Clark versus Board of School Directors, 1868. It involves a 12-year-old black student, Susan Clark, who was refused admittance into the all-white public school in Muscatine, Iowa. Okay, so eventually this case made its way all the way up to the Iowa State Supreme Court. And the Iowa State Supreme Court's job is to interpret the Iowa State Constitution. Well, there's a few sections of the Iowa State Constitution that apply in the, to this situation. First, Article 9, Section 12 states, the Board of Education shall provide for the education of all the use of the state. You put that section together with Article 1, Section 6, which states the General Assembly, or the legislative branch in Iowa, shall not grant to any citizen or class of citizens privileges or immunities which upon the same terms shall not equally belong to all citizens. So when the Iowa State Supreme Court read these two sections of the state law together, they said, well, clearly we are going, denying in this case equal protection of the law. And segregated schools violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Iowa State Constitution. Well, one quote from the case, all the use are equal before the law. 
1868. That is what the Iowa State Supreme Court said when interpreting the Iowa State Constitution. Now here's the thing, the U.S. Constitution provides a floor of rights to American citizens. Individual states can hold a higher standard of what that, those rights actually mean under their own state constitutions. And so the Iowa State Supreme Court prohibited school districts from segregating students based upon race under the Iowa State Constitution. That was not obviously applicable to other states in the United States. In fact, under the U.S. Supreme Court's interpretation of the U.S. Constitution in cases like Plessy versus Ferguson, the U.S. Supreme Court said as long as you have quote unquote equal schools, they can be separate. That's the separate but equal doctrine. Well, the Iowa State Supreme Court said, no, 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 that's separate schools are not equal, at least for purposes of the state of Iowa. So this decision ultimately preceded similar decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court in the case of Brown versus Board of Education, which gets decided in the 1950s, by almost 100 years. So Iowa was far more progressive in terms of its integration of schools than across the United States. Now, to finish out our story about Alexander Clark, Alexander Clark's son, Alexander Clark Jr., becomes the first black graduate of the Iowa Law School. Now, the second black graduate of the Iowa Law School is none other than Alexander Clark Sr., who in his 60s goes and gets his law degree. Now, what about Susan Clark? Well, she's sort of been forgotten in history, but uh, recently the Muscatine School District's Board of Directors voted unanimously to change the name of the Muscatine Junior High School to Susan Clark Junior High School. I always think that if we build another elementary school in Iowa City, we should name it after Alexander Clark and call it Clark Elementary School. Well, the second example of Iowans um, fighting for and advocating for greater rights involves the Iowa suffrage movement. So in 1908, some Iowa women were among the first in the nation to participate in a suffrage protest march. They went out in the streets carrying their banners and signs demanding the right to vote. Now, can you guess where this march took place? Many of you would probably initially think, well, probably Iowa City or maybe Des Moines. No, this march took place in the small town of Boone, Iowa, which is outside of Des Moines. Now they recently had a reenactment of that march and so here is a clip of one of the women giving the speeches at the march. We are here today because women are still trying to persuade American men to believe in and live up to the fundamental principles of democracy. The only thing that a woman is enfranchised with means at all is that a government which claims to be a republic should be a republic. In 1916, this issue was put before the Iowa State voters. Right? There were arguments on both sides. Here we have a list of 12 reasons why women should vote. I, I love this one. Because public-spirited mothers make public-spirited sons. So even in a movement advocating for women's rights, you still have language that, that's very patriarchal in nature. But you have to remember, in 1916, who was actually voting? Men. So in 1916, the men of Iowa um, voted down in a, a change to the Iowa state law that would give, give women the right to vote. So 1916, Iowa voters, all male, voted down women's suffrage or women's right to vote. And the advertisements around this are just crazy, right? Women's suffrage, meaning women's having the right to vote, means high taxes. The tax rate is bound to increase. I don't think those two things have a connection, but that was a fear campaign that was generated by men to try and uh, maintain their power and privilege. That's obviously not the end of the story. In 1918 and 1919, right after World War I, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution was proposed, the 19th Amendment. Remember, in order to pass a constitutional amendment, you need two-thirds of both houses, three-fourths of all states. 
In 1919, Iowa became the 38th state to ratify the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote. The very last state of the three-fourths of all states that are needed. So Iowa may be a little bit slower on this one in terms of moving towards greater rights for women, but ultimately being on the right side of history, giving women the right to vote. The final story I want to tell you about involves an Iowa State Supreme Court case called Burnham v. Bryant, and it was decided in 2009. And the story behind Burnham v. Bryant involves six couples. Um, this is one of them, the named plaintiff, Trish Barnum. Six couples who went to Des Moines to the recorder's office to get a marriage license. So remember from our unit on federalism, marriage licenses are issued by each individual state. These six couples were refused marriage licenses on the sole basis that they were same-sex couples. So in 2007, these six couples sued Polk County for refusing to issue them marriage licenses. This case, like the case involving Alexander Clark, wound its way all the way up to the Iowa State Supreme Court. And the job of the Iowa State Supreme Court was to interpret the Iowa State Constitution. And so they looked at that Article 1, Section 6, uh, the same language that the court looked at in the case involving Susan Clark. This is the Equal Protection Clause. And they focus in on this idea that the law should treat people equally, that states should not be granting any special privileges to certain citizens. And so in this way, the minority rights are protected in Iowa. So the Iowa State Supreme Court recognized same-sex couples that they had the right to marry under the Equal Protection Clause of the Iowa State Constitution. And so you may recognize actually one of the people that was one of the named plaintiffs in this case. Uh, this is Jen Barbarusk, our nurse who works down in the health office. And so one of the great heroes of Iowa in terms of leading the, the way as a plaintiff in this case to ensure that same-sex couples got the right to marry and could enjoy all the privileges of being married. So Iowa became the third state in the nation to legalize same-sex marriage. It was really the first state that was not on the coast. So you had the very first state was Massachusetts and then Connecticut. This was a strategic choice by the attorneys who were representing these plaintiffs. They were from an organization called Lambda Legal that provides legal work in the fight for civil rights for the LGBTQ community. Is this going to be the end of this issue? No. Uh, there were a lot of people in Iowa who were upset about the decision. And so the, the next political act that you can take if the Supreme Court makes a decision interpreting the law one way, the thing that you would need to do if you want to get the law changed then is to get a constitutional amendment passed. So there was an attempt to get a constitutional amendment to redefine um, a marriage between a man and a woman. And so that a constitutional amendment um, banning same-sex marriage was proposed, but ultimately voted down by the Iowa General Assembly. There's a terrific speech by what was at the time a young um, graduate of West High School, a guy named Zach Walls. And if you're interested in that speech, you can check the link below. And Zach Walls is now currently serving in the Iowa State Senate, representing the, a district in Iowa City. The U.S. Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage nationwide in 2015, so nine years after the Varnum case was decided, and they applied that exact same rationale using the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution and interpreting it as guaranteeing civil rights to this LGBTQ minority community. So the question is, that we started with, our state motto, our liberties we prize, our rights we will maintain, I think if you use these three case studies as examples, the um, way in which Iowa has desegregated schools nearly 85 years before the schools were desegregated at the federal level, the attempts that were made to ensure women's suffrage, and then finally the fact that Iowa was the third state to recognize same-sex marriage in years before the U.S. Supreme Court got around to using that same rationale, that I think there is some truth to this statement. There are liberties we certainly prize here, and there are civil rights that we will fight for and defend. So the big questions you should be able to answer after watching this video and the previous video on Iowa State government are, what are the characteristics of the Iowa State government? And two, how has state government lived up to the Iowa motto?
As always, thanks for watching.